Let me ask you a question, and I want you to be honest with me. Have you ever watched a clip from The Big Short and ended up falling into an inescapable YouTube hole? How about Moneyball? Yeah, me too. Not only have I done this, I've noticed these clips on the recommended cues of others, and when I ask them, they all confirm that they've done the same. And the reason for that, as far as I can tell, is the bizarre alignment of the YouTube algorithm and one man's writing. Or at least, so I originally thought. Even if you aren't familiar with the name Aaron Sorkin, you're probably familiar with at least some of his work, from stage to screen and everything in between. A Few Good Men, The Social Network, West Wing. His writing career is one of dizzying highs and occasional lows, but when something of his hits, it hits hard. And if you've ever watched something he's written, it is usually marked with a particular style, one in which other writers sought to integrate and refine. This video was originally going to be about the correlation between binge consumption on YouTube and writer-director Adam McKay. He has a similar writing sensibility to Sorkin, so much so that I was ready to crown him as the new Aaron Sorkin. Which is funny because, if you'd asked me, I'd have sworn up and down that McKay was behind both The Big Short and Moneyball. But as it turns out, Moneyball was actually written by Sorkin. I'm not other people. I'm not other people. I'm not other people. I'm not other people. Don't talk to me like I'm other people. And don't talk to me like I'm other people. Sorkin and McKay have a writing style marked by tight, rapid-fire dialogue, interspersed with razor-sharp humor, and conversations that feel heavily weighted regardless of the stakes. Their characters are all written like each is accustomed to being the smartest person in the room. So when you put any combination of them in the same room, it feels like a rhetorical clash of the titans. And their scenes frequently end with, for lack of a better term, a mic drop. As the aforementioned clash of characters with different ideas, perspectives, and beliefs, every scene ends with one of them as the clear winner, which is always the person who had the last word before the camera cuts. God, you are an incredibly big piece of shit. It often doesn't even have to be the characters we're meant to sympathize with, as this device is frequently used to humble those characters and teach them lessons, so they can later emerge victorious in the narrative. Back. We've been doing this for a long time. Why don't you just let us be responsible for replacing Giambi with who we know that can play? Because it's their story. Well, it's not really their story. You see, Moneyball and The Big Short are both works of creative nonfiction, which can be especially challenging to craft as your story already exists in the real events it's based on. So writing it becomes an act of dressing things up and boiling them down into something enjoyable for the audience, while hopefully not taking too many liberties with the source material, which is just perfect for Sorkin and McKay, because that's in their nature as writers. They're already adept at transforming nonsense into genius, mundane into compelling, and as you'll see, bullshit into truth. And because these scenes build tension through conversation and confrontation, and because they end in a single decisive moment with a clear victor, they are the perfect recipe for a YouTube clip, each one the perfect bite-sized morsel, which is why they rise through the algorithm and why, if you're watching this, you've probably already viewed some if not all of them. But everything I've just described is a parlor trick a writer proverbially showing you the Red Queen for just a moment before hiding it out of sight. McKay and Sorkin are both talented writers whose track record speaks for itself, but their writing is designed to sound smart, meaning if you look for it, you'll find times when it sounds smarter than it actually is. Let's start with Moneyball by Aaron Sorkin and starring Brad Pitt and Jonah Hill. The story tells the tale of the 2002 Oakland Athletics, a ragtag bunch of nobodies who go from division basement dwellers to playoff contenders, thanks to general manager Billy Bean's unique approach to cultivating talent through raw statistical analysis. You see, the Oakland A's have a problem. What's the problem? Well, the problem is... No, what's the problem? Well, the problem is... So, the problem is that the way Major League Baseball is run, even if the Oakland A's were to develop and cultivate a team of superstar players, the richer teams would just lure them away with juicier contracts. But that doesn't matter anyway, because the film goes to great lengths to show you that these old guys scouting young ball players, as well as conventional wisdom around the league, don't really know what they're talking about, and they can't see the bigger picture the way he and Peter Brand can. Baseball thinking is medieval. They are asking all the wrong questions. So they put together a roster comprised of players who represent the best value on the dollar in order to compete. And it works. The small budget team breaks the all-time record for consecutive wins and makes the playoffs. And all of Bean and Brand's ideas come to fruition. Or at least they do according to Sorkin's script. See, if you step back and look at the equation, the problem, what's the problem? And the solution, you'll find that it all involves a circular logic. The Oakland A's are developing a wealth of young superstars. The bigger market teams are then taking those superstars, therefore the scouting department isn't all that useful. But without the scouting department, you don't have the young talent to be taken in the first place. Also, there's this. Your goal shouldn't be to buy players, your goal should be to buy wins. And in order to buy wins, you need to buy runs. If you 
want full disclosure, I think it's a good thing that you got Damon off your payroll. <laughs> The film also goes to great lengths to hide the abundance of young talent on this very Oakland A's roster. That season, three Oakland A's made the All-Star team. Miguel Tejada, Eric Chavez, and Barry Zito. And all three were drafted and cultivated by the A's scouting department and farm system. None of them were featured in the movie in favor of people that we can afford. Because everyone else in baseball undervalues them. Like an island of misfit toys. Also, just as a sidebar, it's kind of hilarious if you stop and think about the entire premise of the movie. The problem... No, what's the problem? ...is that professional baseball players are able to negotiate the value of their labor. And that just isn't fair to... Stephen Schott, real estate mogul and founder of one of California's largest home builders. That poor bastard. Now, The Big Short makes no claim of even trying to be historically accurate. In fact, the film frequently breaks the fourth wall just to tell you it isn't. Okay, so this part isn't totally accurate. You know, we didn't find Jared Bennett's housing bubble pitch in the lobby of a bank that rejected us. But even here, we find dialogue that, while sounding razor sharp, is like an old rug that can come apart the moment you pull on a thread. In this scene, all of the various investors who shorted the housing market are wondering why the ratings haven't gone down, despite their value very publicly spiraling into freefall. Mark and Vinny visit the woman at the ratings agency for answers and, after some plying, she reveals that they have to give out good ratings or the banks will stop doing business with them. Mark expresses his shock and disgust at this level of corruption, and we get this exchange. You can't be held responsible for doing shitty and illegal things. What are you, for? No, I am not for, Mr. Baum. I am not. No. And I wonder, I wonder what your incentives might be. Is it maybe in your best interest to have the ratings change? Is it, perhaps? How many credit default swaps do we own? Hmm? Does that make you wrong? Hmm. Just makes you a hypocrite. Wait, what? Just makes you a hypocrite. What did she just, just say? Makes you a hypocrite. What the fuck did she just say? It makes you a Hypocrisy is defined as the practice of claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. Okay, now let's restate the context here. The ratings agencies are corrupt. They were refusing to provide honest assessments because they are leveraged by the banks and are thus performing services which are dishonest, fraudulent, and possibly illegal. Mark Baum shorted mortgage bonds. How does this make him a hypocrite? Is she implying that if you profit from doing good, not only is it no longer doing good, but you are a bad person for advocating for good, which is now not good? Let's try plugging this into an analogy. Let's say you were a manager at a company and the company simply stops giving everyone their paychecks. Your employees come to you complaining about not getting paid. So you go to upper management and tell them they're doing shitty and illegal things. Then someone in upper management says to you, well now, you haven't been paid either. How much do you stand to profit if we do the right thing? That makes you a hypocrite. You see how that doesn't in any way make you a hypocrite? But hey, it sure sounds like a slam dunk. A mic drop, right? She made an accusation, the scene faded to black, and the YouTube clip ended. She sure put him in his place with a scathing piece of dialogue that is positively bingeable on YouTube. But if you stop and think about it within the context for more than a second, it sounds downright stupid. But hey, at least it sounded smart, right? Thanks for watching. You know, it takes a real solid gold asshole to call out another writer's writing. So if you want to check out my writing and do the same, you can find a link for Noirlum, which is in the description. It's currently in pre-order and should be coming out before the end of the year. Thanks again for watching. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time.